morning and thank you for joining us this Saturday morning for a very informative workshop on organic vegetable gardening in Zone 10. My name is Eileen Pais and I am a Special Events and Program Supervisor for the Village of Palmetto Bay Parks and Recreation Department and your moderator for today's workshop. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank Johan George, the Village IT Technician, who is assisting me on the back end of this presentation and of course our special guest leading the presentation, Terry Steffen. As we move to almost six months into this pandemic, you may have read about and seen so many families taking comfort in gardening, whether they were growing in their backyards or inside their home. The experience of millions of citizens being quarantined really opened the opportunity to connect more with nature, and for many, gardening became a hobby. That's why today's presentation on organic vegetable gardening comes in such perfect timing. Fall is just around the corner. It's a season that brings beginnings of new growth, in our gardens and optimism. A feeling of, hey, I did this. I did something good here. I believe that this pandemic has taught us that gardening really does make us feel more self-reliant and allows us to gain more control over our food source. We hope that Terry will inspire you and give you the necessary tools to become a better and more knowledgeable gardener in our community. At this time, I'd like to virtually introduce to you Terry Steffen, who is a longtime resident of Palmetto Bay, 33 years, and a lifelong vegetable and landscape gardener. Terry loves to share her passion for planet Earth and its particular ability to grow and heal. She feels that she can't fix the whole planet, but that she can certainly make her little slice of it as healthy and productive as possible. She can teach, if she can teach her neighbors the basic principles of gardening, then her purpose is fulfilled because the whole environment improves. If Terry's face looks a bit familiar to you, that's because she's been teaching responsible gardening workshops at Talada State Park since 2015. She has taught workshops about raised bed vegetable gardening, butterfly gardening, composting, growing mangoes, and even an art and gardening workshops like painting with tropical plants and flower arranging tropicals. It certainly has been a pleasure working with Terry for the past five years and the village of Palmetto Bay is so grateful to have such a wonderful citizen and master gardener in our community, who is generally passionate about teaching all the wonderful and simple things we can do to make our planet healthier and more sustainable. Before I turn it over to Terry, I want to remind you that if you have any questions for Terry throughout this presentation, to please make sure you type your questions into the village Facebook comic section for this live feed. At the end of the presentation, Terry will be happy to answer all your questions. And now, without further ado, I turn it over to Terry. Good morning, gardeners. Special thank you to Selin and Johan, who is keeping our technology running for us. Being a farmer's daughter, I have been in gardens my entire life. I can tell you that walking into the garden before breakfast and snacking on produce right off the vine is one of my fondest pleasures. When I began my master gardener training, I thought I knew a lot about plants. After the first day, I was convinced that I knew almost nothing. By the end of the course, I felt that I had learned a little bit. We all can continue to learn about gardening throughout our lives. Today, I will teach you the fundamentals of starting a raised bed garden and why we do it that way here. My hope is that you come away inspired and eager to begin. For those of you who have done this before, hopefully you will pick up a few tips. I will be moving very quickly as there is much to cover, but this presentation is recorded so you can go back and look at it later. I will teach you how to access the resources that all Florida Master Gardeners use to teach and answer questions. Today we'll learn about choosing plant varieties for your location, especially in uh, South Dade for choosing the best location for your garden, how to build a raised bed garden, properly prepare your soil, and understand how fertilizers work. Let's talk about zone 10. Usually when I say zone 10, I get sort of a cross-eyed look and say, well, what is that? Well, it's not exactly the twilight zone, but it is a little bit. If you look at the map, all the beautiful colors, it may be a little hard to see the key on the right, but down here in South Florida at the very tip, the color is a dark orange. The only place where it's darker is in Puerto Rico. This is a USDA plant hardiness zone map that they put together and the zones are based on 
the lowest sustained temperature in an area over a period of time. Here in South Florida, it rarely gets to 30 degrees. So that puts us, according to the key, on zone 10, uh, A and B. B is uh, right at the very tip down in Homestead. It gets even less cold down there. The keys are zone 11. I grew up in zone six, which is up in Connecticut. You can see that uh, if you go up the coast where it turns dark green, it stays at 20 degrees sometimes up there for a week at a time. So you could imagine how much different gardening is. So our soil is different here. So we use raised beds to help control that. Our plant selection needs to be different here because our environment doesn't always support what the rest of the country does. I'm gonna to explain to you how fertilizer works so you understand what you're doing. And then we'll talk about trouble in paradise. Before we go any further, here's the mom talk. Be careful out there. You shouldn't be gardening in flip-flops. You need shoes that close and protect your feet. You need to protect yourself from the sun and you need to be wearing gloves when you're working in the garden. These may sound really, really simple and obvious. The other day, I just literally pulled one little weed out of my garden without gloves on. My hand brushed past a pineapple plant and I got a thorn that took me two days to get out because it was very tiny and practically invisible. Make sure you stay hydrated and if you're getting too hot, quit for the day. It's all right to give up, tomorrow's coming. Organic gardening has many meanings and it partly depends on what it means to you. The uh, definition is it's gardening free of chemical additives and free of pesticides. Definitely free of pesticides. I don't wanna eat them. Certainly the bugs don't wanna eat them. Um, whether you, or not you decide to go completely organic and stay away from commercially produced fertilizers is up to you. I do use them. I'm careful what I choose but I find that um, some addition of fertilizer does help. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Let's talk about the soil here. The different soils in Dade County are sand. We all know what that is. Marl, which is crushed up limestone mixed with sand. Muck, which you'll find in swampy areas and by the side of canals and water's edge. These soils are very low in nutrients that are needed for vegetable gardening but they're very high in nutrients needed for growing tropical plants. That's why we have such a lush landscape here, but vegetables really struggle. A lot of people ask me, should I get my soil tested, which is a common thing to do throughout the country. Well, I'm gonna save you $45 and tell you that our soil has been tested and tested and tested. So you can save your money and just know that if you're away from the edge of the coast, your soil pH is about a 7.5, which is very high. Vegetable, garden vegetables want to see more of a 5 to 5.5. So the, our soil is not compatible with your tomatoes and lettuce and beans and so on. We have poor nitrogen, but we are very high in phosphorus, which is why things flower so well here. Our soil is also very poor at water retention. And we're going to learn a whole lot about more about the diseases in our soil that can cause problems in the garden too. If you're next to the coast, you can add salt to that mix, which is also not good for vegetable gardens. So why raised bed gardens? You're gonna see a few pictures of this. This is mine and my dog, Chester. With a raised bed garden, you're basically building a container and you can control what goes on in there. And you can keep out the bad things that our soil contains. Raised bed gardens are a lot less work because things are compact. You can have one small garden like mine or you can have many small gardens, but you don't need tractors and big heavy equipment. It's very manageable with your hands. And because everything is compact, you'll have a higher yield per square foot. Where do you put your garden? This is a fairly popular question. I always say it needs eight full hours of sun. And some people say, well, I, I kind of get four. Well, you're kind of going to have problems. You need to find a sunny spot. A couple of years ago, I had the pleasure to be in Alaska and I was blown away at the gardening up there. Well, they get 12 hours of sun and more in the summer. And the sun is a massive resource for our plants. So you need eight hours of full sun. So if you don't have that in your yard, try a container garden on a sunny patio or a balcony. 
you need to be near a water source. Um, carrying water in a bucket can be heavy, so you don't want it to be terribly far away. A rain barrel is a wonderful resource because it's reclaimed rainwater, which is a wonderful, perfect pH for our plants. You want to put your garden away from tree roots because they will cause a lot of problems, including competition for water and resources, and keep it away from your septic. Here is a big problem with our local soil. There are, there are bugs in the soil. This particular one that you're looking at is a real bad boy called a root knot nematode. It, this picture is one on the root of a tomato plant. Just a few days before the tomato was ready to give over its tomatoes, um, these microorganisms, which cannot be seen with the naked eye, attack the root system, causing these knots all over it. And all of a sudden, they reach critical mass and the plant dies very suddenly. It's a tragedy. It's very upsetting. It will make you cry. But by using a raised bed garden, we control the soil, therefore no nematodes. I'm going to show you some pictures of a few different kinds of raised beds that you can either purchase as kits, have a carpenter build, or build yourself. This one is a really pretty one, um, built out of wood. It looks like pine. Um, very, very simple to build if you can have somebody cut the boards for you or if you're good at doing that sort of thing. Um, I stay away from wood because it breaks down very quickly in our environment. If you're going to use wood, make sure it is not pressure treated lumber because pressure treated lumber is treated with chemicals. The older pressure treated lumber is treated with arsenic. The newer is not, but still I don't want any of those sort of chemicals in my organic garden. This raised bed garden is an animal watering trough. Um, if you're gonna use this, it's super easy to move and you know, put where you want it before you fill it with soil. You just have to be sure that you poke some holes in the bottom so it will drain well. Uh, this is a little less bending over and very, very tidy. Notice there's plenty of space in between for you to walk. Uh, and again, there's a water source nearby. This raised bed, I hesitated to show you because the plants don't look terribly happy. It's not mine, but it is up on legs, which is fantastic to eliminate bending. And you can even pull a wheelchair up to it. So you might consider putting your raised bed garden on legs as long as they're sturdy and I need to teach that gardener how to grow some plants. This is a really fun raised bed garden built out of um, what looks like pallets. Uh, wonderful, terrific idea. It's got all these different levels. It's got all these little pockets that you can put herbs and flowers in as well. Just wanna make sure that that is not treated, uh, pressure treated lumber. So here we are back to mine. And I'm going to give you a recipe on how to start a garden exactly like mine. If you want to use any of the other products, there are so many on the internet that you can buy and bring home and put together. But this one it will give you an idea of what goes into it. So this is what we do. I started with 24 cement blocks that are approximately 8 by 16. They're actually 8 by 15 and a half. I do not know why. And I set them down with the holes facing up so I can use those as little planters for flowers and herbs, and I put pineapple tops in there too. Before you place your cement blocks, you're gonna put a layer of flattened cardboard boxes on the ground. This gives you a permeable barrier between Miami-Dade soil and the good soil that you're gonna put in. The barrier needs to extend past the, past the concrete blocks so that the soil in those holes is also protected from nematodes and other creepy crawlies. You'll need garden soil or topsoil. For this size garden, probably eight to 10 bags. A brick of peat moss, which is very large, that keeps your soil soft and aerated. Compost, if you have it, and I'll talk some more about that in a minute. Your compost must be composted, meaning it's broken down. Uh, and some fully composted cow manure. And I'll give you some caveats on that. If you're using manure, it needs to come from an animal that does not eat meat. Fully composted means it's broken down. I don't recommend going to a store and bringing home buckets of manure. First of all, it will make your car smell terrible, and also it's too strong to go in your little bed. It needs to be fully broken down. If you buy a bag of fully composted cow manure, it will barely have any smell at all, and it's an instant fertilizer. If you are a vegan, you can skip this step. So how do you make homemade compost? Well, I'm gonna break down a two-hour lecture 
into about two minutes. This is my compost area in my yard. It needs to be in full sun because it needs to get hot. I have two bins. You see the square one in the back that is three feet by three feet by three feet. That's the smallest size that will work. And the other bin in the foreground is two pieces that are taken apart directly behind them is compost that's been working. I then put these rings back together next to that compost pile and with a pitchfork, move what's not composted, what was on the top into the bottom of the bin. And at the very bottom of that pile will be my soil, which has made itself magically in the sun. This is what was at the bottom of the pile. Now you'll see that there are many, many things not yet broken down. That's why I use a pitchfork because I can easily lift that off the top so the, the non-composted material back into the compost bin and that soil at the bottom is what we're after. That is the gold that goes into the garden. It is a slow release natural fertilizer, fully organic if what I put into my compost bin was organic. It improves the texture of the soil. It can be used as a top dressing or a mulch layer and it improves the water retention of the soil. You'll see in my compost, and I'm probably the only one that's shown her garbage today, but you'll see a lot of pistachio shells, my husband's favorite snack. So we have a lot of them and they don't break down very fast. I leave that in the soil because it does help aerate and it will break down some more without harming the garden. So this is what my garden looked like after I added my recipe, my cow manure, my compost, some soil and some peat moss. I mixed it all together with a shovel and smoothed it all out. And never once did I step in the garden. Our garden is five feet wide, never wider, so that I can reach into it from both sides. We never want to stop, step on our soil and compact it. The deepest we need uh, is 10 to 15 inches. I keep mine at about 10 inches. The root system of most vegetables that we're going to plant is less than 10 inches. Even a full grown tomato plant is only 10 inches deep. If you want to plant really big carrots, you might want to go to 15 inches but really that's about the full depth that you'll need. Again, the soil is not compacted. We don't want a hard brick in there. We want the little baby roots to be able to reach around very easily. And the next step is to solarize. That means we cover it with a dark tarp for about six weeks. I put mine on at the end of August because I had a, a cooler morning out there and some time to work and I'm solarizing that. It's a matter of baking the soil if there's anything from my compost, if there's anything from any of the other products that I added in, this will take care of it. It will kill disease. It will kill uh, seeds that may have gotten into the compost, except for papaya. They do tend to come up anyway. You can, might get a free papaya tree. You'll see in the very front right corner, there is a rosemary plant there. I did not solarize that. That gets to live in there all the time. So I don't want to cover that with the tarp. So solarizing is something you want to do every year. The very first year you build your garden, you really don't have to unless you have time to. And again, I've topped off all those holes in the bricks with fresh compost um, and a soil mixture because I'll be planting those, but I'm not going to put in there plants that worry about nematodes. So that's why it's not solarized. Guess what? It's almost time. Only a few weeks and it's planting day. The second week of October is when we begin planting in Miami-Dade in zone 10. That's when all the fun begins and we'll finish up in the middle to the end of March. So our calendar is upside down from the rest of the country. This is one of my very favorite slides to share. What do we plant and how do you know? Well, the University of Florida has done so much work for us. They have researched it and they have given us wonderful answers. This is the first part. I'll show you the next part of the slide in a minute, but we're gonna talk about what the crop is. In this case, beans, broccoli, carrots, and collards, the plant family, the planting dates. You'll see October right on through. Days to harvest, that's from when you plant. Space between plants. Remember, we're not gonna have rows. We're just gonna put our plants right up next to each other according to this chart. The seed depth. Notice that it's one inch, one and a half inch. It never really goes beyond that. I don't want to see anybody sticking their finger as far as they can into the soil and putting the seed at the bottom of the hole. We don't need to do that here. We just basically need a dusting of soil on top. And the next column is the gold, the varieties that are suggested by the university. This doesn't mean these are the only things that grow here. This means that 
these are proven to do well here. So let's go to the next part of this slide and go on down to the bottom where there are tomatoes. This is a really popular plant here, and there's absolutely nothing more delicious than a tomato straight off the stem. Again, we're gonna plant in March. We'll begin to harvest around January and February all the way through to the end. I'm sorry, we begin in October, we finish in March, but you'll, you'll get some fruit in October, ah, uh, nah, wrong, in January, February, and March. Um, the seeds take from planting to harvest about 90 days, maybe a little bit sooner. Your plants need to be 18 to 24 inches apart. They're pretty big and bushy. Your seeds only go half an inch into the soil. And I have already started my tomato plants, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. So now's a great time if you want to grow from seed, and I highly recommend that you do. You, there's so much variety available to you, uh, especially in the heirloom field. You could start them right now. They're ready to go. And the university has suggested that the tomatoes that do really well here are the cherry type, the plum type, and other small fruited varieties. Now, I have friends that can grow big tomatoes. I don't have good luck with them. But they suggest as um, varieties the Juliet, the Roma, and the Sweet 100. So I decided, according to this, I'm going to give that Juliet a try. So I went on the internet and I searched to see what what seed companies had Juliet seeds, I found a lot. I am not suggesting any particular seed company. This just happens to be the one that I chose. And they came in five days. It was really terrific. Uh, they had the Juliet seeds. And I start them in a takeout food container. I think we're all using a lot of those right now. This food container is a perfect terrarium to start seeds. I put little peat pods in there. Filled, them with, filled the container with water till they were fully absorbed, and then put one seed in the center of each little hole. They sprouted in about three days. This is what they will look like about uh, three weeks later, if, and then I can transplant them into a bigger pot, but not a big pot. We wanna have a lot of control. I recommend plastic because uh, they do so much better. They hold water better. The uh, clay pots tend to cause the water to evaporate much too fast. This happens to be peppers, but your tomato plants will look about this size and this is ready to go into the garden. This is what we call a transplant. You can buy these or start them yourself by seed. So fertilizer, this frightens everyone. If you want a really funny thing to do, go to a big box uh, hardware store, stand in the fertilizer aisle and watch people's faces. They're completely confused. I'm gonna take a little bit of that away for you today. Again, I'm not suggesting any brands, that's why I've blanked this one out, but let's talk about how to decide what to buy. Every fertilizer package has a guaranteed analysis on either the front or the back of it. This one is 10, 10, 10. That means the top three nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash or potassium are always in that order according to that amount, 10 parts per 100. So for vegetable gardening, we want a balanced fertilizer, a 10-10-10, a 666, a 20-20-20. And the key to doing this right is to read the directions and follow them. If it says a gallon of water and an ounce of fertilizer, don't think you can cheat on that. It really means a gallon and an ounce. If you don't have an ounce measure, get one. Learn to do it exactly according to the recipe. You'll have a much better outcome and you won't harm your plants. Okay, so I use a 10, 10, 10, probably throughout the growing season, I'll only use four or five cups of this 35 pound bag and the rest I can use on my landscape later. Here's a little hidden clue. The best fertilizer for your landscape is a Palm Special, which is an eight to 12. Okay, that's a little, little side note for you there, but 10, 10, 10 is great for your vegetable garden. If it's a water soluble and it comes in a little green and yellow box, make sure you mix it with water. This particular one is a uh, top dressing that I use. Okay, sometimes there's trouble in paradise. You've planted your garden and everything's growing and everything's going fine and all of a sudden you come out in the morning and this wild beast is eating your tomatoes. This is a hornworm caterpillar and he's voracious. They can get two to three inches long and they can take apart a tomato plant in one night. So how do I learn what to do? What is it? What do I... How do I solve this problem? I personally catch these guys, put them in a container on the driveway and the birds come and get them. 
there are much worse ways of getting rid of them. But to find out what to do, I'm going to share with you how master gardeners find out what to do. There are two ways to search. Go to your browser, type in what you want to know. Say I have a you can type in green caterpillar on tomatoes and you can add the word IFAS, which stands for University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Agricultural Services. This is where all the university-based information is. They've done the work for us. Now we just need to go look it up. Same thing, if you type in green caterpillar on tomatoes and add it with EDIS, which is the electronic data information source of the University of Florida, your search results will come back with information from UF. And it is fabulous. Sometimes I can get lost for hours just reading through it. But usually within the first two or three search results, you'll get the answer to your questions. And that's how I learned about that nasty green caterpillar. Or if you're growing squash, somebody called me once and said, there's white powder on the leaves of my squash and they don't look very good. So I typed in white powder. Lee, white powder on squash leaves IFAS, and it came back to be powdery mildew, and there was a solution there. So that's how master gardeners find their information. It is a wonderful research method. I guarantee you will love it. Okay, another problem. There are plants that need support. We put in our tomatoes, our, our peppers, and our beans. Beans grow like mad here, by the way. You'll have many, many, many beans on very few plants but they need some support. The typical tomato cages that they sell in retail don't do very well. The plants tend to get top heavy and the cages fall over because we can't sink the little legs into our soil far enough. We hit, we hit good old limestone. So you might consider building your own. You need something that's sturdy. There are a lot of methods out there. I would definitely search it up with IFAS and EDIS. And if you know a friend that's doing really well, ask them how they support. This particular photo shows you a really good one. This can be made of rebar or another strong wire. We do get freezes here, okay? Every year we have at least one night, sometimes up to five, where the temperature drops into the low 30s. Even if it's only hanging out there for an hour or two, it can destroy our garden. So while you're building your garden, it's a great idea to plan ahead on how you're going to put a cover on it for those few nights that we need because it's very, very disappointing if your plants get destroyed by cold or by a high wind. Sometimes that happens in the winter. In this photograph, they've taken a quarter inch PVC pipe and just made loops. If you just have the loops ready, you can pop them in at the last minute, cover it with a sheet, tie it down, and you're ready for the night. So be prepared for those few nights when we have a problem. You're going to need to pull the weeds that come up in your garden and you will quickly learn what your seeds produced and what weeds produced. Weeds are going to compete for water and nutrients and space and sunlight. We need to get them out and it's really easy in raised bed to keep up with that. It won't, it won't overwhelm you. You're going to need to water often. I recommend rain barrel. Follow Miami-Dade County watering guidelines because there is a water moratorium at all times. There are days you're allowed to do it, but you can use your reclaimed rainwater all the time. There are no restrictions. You're going to need to fertilize every three to four weeks. You're going to need to protect from frost and you're going to need to share because you're going to have so much lettuce, you're not going to know what to do with it all. If you are interested in becoming a master gardener, you can go to this link, Gardening Solutions or Solutions for Your Life, gardeningsolutions.ifis.ufl.edu and learn more about it. You can call the local extension office and they can help you also. So you can do this. I know you can. Just because you think you don't have a green thumb, I believe that you do. So now I'm going to turn it over to Saylin to read some questions that were coming in from Facebook. Saylin, are you there? Hi, Terry. Yes, thank you. That was a great presentation. I've learned so much about organic gardening. So let's get started with some of our questions that we got from our viewers. So one viewer um, wrote, where to find rain barrels? Any local, local areas? Oh, that's wonderful. Everybody wants to know that. 
Um, there are several things you can do. You can certainly search it up on the internet. A lot of the big box retailers and hardware stores have different options, certainly online as well. Um, I found mine in the first try out on Craigslist. Um, some of the um, uh, shops down in the Redland have them left over from food grade products and they'll sell them for 20 to $40 a piece. Also, you can check with the extension office in uh, Miami-Dade, and I'll give you that number. That phone number is 305-248-3311, and you can ask if there are any rain barrel workshops coming up. And when you take a rain barrel workshop, they give you lots of great information, but you also get to walk away with a rain barrel that has been plumbed by you with a spigot and all the information you need to install it. So uh, I really recommend a workshop. I know with the pandemic, they might not be running them right now, um, but they're not hard to put together at all. Certainly there are a lot of products you can buy online. Great, thank you. Can you can you say that number one more time, Terry? And then I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and put it on, on Facebook. Can you repeat that number once again? For the, um, extension office is 305-248-3311. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have the next question coming in. How do you keep raccoons, opossums, etc., out of your garden? Well, that's a hard one. It's also hard to keep a big yellow lab out of the garden. Um, you probably, if you're having a big problem with those, you're going to need some fencing. There are a lot of different kinds. Chicken wire works very, very well. You'll need some supports on the ends to attach the chicken wire to. Um, that has a nice big hole sometimes you can reach your hand through it sometimes not but you can reach over it hopefully they won't climb the chicken wire um, there are a lot of fencing products ready made that you can just literally stick into the soil around your garden but fencing is the best way and of course completely organic great great suggestion um, we have another question coming in how do you keep roaches, this is a big problem, not just in your garden, but everywhere. How do you keep roaches from aggregating in the compost in Florida? It's so humid. Well, I'm gonna give you some bad news. It's actually good and bad news. Um, if you are keeping a compost bin in your yard, you have created a buffet for them and they're very happy to attend. Roaches will not hurt your compost. I know they're disgusting and if you don't wanna reach your hand in there because it'll just crawl up your arm and trust me it's happened and it's kind of creepy but they don't hurt anything and they actually help aerate the compost as it's working so they're kind of a good problem um, you really can't keep them out you don't want to put pesticide in there for sure so mostly I'm going to tell you don't worry about it there are compost bins that you can buy that are sealed um, big drums that might have just uh, air holes in them that the roaches can't get into uh, that it's you know, there's going to be a commitment of funds to buy one of those, but those keep a lot of bugs out. But compost works because of insects and microorganisms. So I hate to tell you this, but they're your friend. Wow, Terry, I think that's the first positive thing I've ever heard about roaches. I'm <laughs> sorry to say. Okay, we have lots of we have lots of questions coming in now. I think this one you may have already answered, but someone else asked, what can we do to protect the garden from squirrels? I think we go back to the whole fencing, maybe. Yeah, I mean, squirrels can get through just about anything. I've never had squirrels in my garden. That's never been a problem. Um, certainly, they, they wreak havoc in my avocado tree because they take one bite of each avocado, same with mangoes. And I'd be happy to share one whole avocado, but not a bite from each. Um, squirrels have not been a problem in my garden, certainly a tight mesh fencing but you're probably going to need to fence across the top too but i have never had a problem with squirrels so uh the only thing i could suggest is is fencing okay thank you good advice all right we have another great question should you put mulch at the bottom of the raised bed you definitely can use mulch as a top dressing around your plants make sure it's clean mulch you don't want like something with dye or chemicals in it um, but a clean mulch at the top helps hold moisture in the soil and keeps weeds out. So it, it's actually quite terrific. And you can use your compost as a mulch if you have some leftover. I never have any leftover. I use it all up. But it's a nice top dressing and it does 
uh, help this, the moisture stay in and the weeds stay out. Great. Good, good stuff. Um, so here's a question that I actually uh, had asked you um, even before this workshop where I had some issues with growing tomatoes and now I know why. Uh, but the question is, when is the best time to plant tomatoes here in, in Florida? The second weekend of October. I've already started mine um, in little uh, peat pots and they're up and I'm about ready to transfer them into bigger pots. Um, so. Uh, definitely that's about the earliest. The sun is too intense before that to have them in full sunlight all the time. So um, last year I took a pretty severe gardening injury and ruined my knee and I didn't get my tomato plants in until December because I couldn't walk. And believe it or not, I had a bumper crop of tomatoes last year. So if you miss the second weekend of October, don't panic and think, oh, I didn't do it in time, this isn't gonna work. It will, that's the beginning. We still have plenty of time after that. But definitely not in the summer. People have had some success with it, but uh, in the next couple of weeks, it'll be perfect. Yes, that was great information. I learned my lesson. <laughs> um, okay, I have another question. So my dog likes to dig in my garden. What is the best way to keep him out? Keep him out? Just fencing again? Fencing is, fencing works really well for me. I bought some cute little metal fencing at one of the big box hardware stores and uh it's only two and a half feet high but i was really amazed how easy it was to train the dog not to bother that and i have a big goofy lab and he just kind of does whatever he wants to do and he learned it's just not even worth jumping over that two foot two and a half foot barrier and he stays out completely and uh two other dogs that are well trained they're smart and they know not to bother. So they learn pretty quickly and the fence, this little short fencing is very easy to put in and take out. Good, good information. Um, another question is, so I tried growing squash and I never got any, what did I do wrong? Okay, it's not your fault. Squash is tricky to grow here without chemical intervention. One of the things squash needs desperately is to be pollinated by insects. And uh, because so many yards here are insect free because of chemicals or they don't have any plants that invite insects, um, uh, it's hard to attract them. So my biggest suggestion is if you're gonna use the cement blocks uh, method that I used, in all those little holes all the way around, plant flowers that bloom that will attract butterflies and bees, the local, um, pollinating bees are very friendly and it takes a lot to make them mad and I'm around them all the time and I've never been stung by one so they'll come and visit a flower and take off and do their work you can hand pollinate your squashes um, with a q-tip um, and you can read all about that by googling hand pollinating squashes ifis or edis and you can learn how to do it um, for me it's kind of tedious but I find even though the, in in the redland they produce truckloads of squash i have a hard time growing it in my garden i have friends who are very successful at it but usually it's a pollinating problem sometimes you will get a pottery mildew and um, by searching that up on the internet with edis or ifis you'll learn about the correct um methods of controlling that and it's an insecticidal soap i believe um and you don't want to be using dish soap and things like that you want to use a product made just for the purpose um, or you can really harm your plants. That's that's such good information, and and our pollinators are so important to how our gardens really thrive. Um, we have another question came in. Um, are there fruits and vegetables that can be grown and cared for indoors? All the other easier ones than um, fruits and vegetables that we can grow indoors. Well, cilantro is a good one. Uh, you need a kind yes. of. A Honey window, uh, sometimes parsley. A lot of the herbs grow really well inside. Um, a big highlight to basil. Yes. The basil <laughs> that you typically buy. This is this makes people cry. They buy these beautiful basil plants and they look terrific. And they get them home and they put them out in their garden and all of a sudden they get black spots on them and they die and it's very upsetting. There's a fungus in the air that we cannot control. A lot of the basil that you'll buy is from a hot house where the environment's controlled but it's a species issue. If you look for the variety called uh, spicy globe basil, it is resistant to the diseases and it grows like crazy and it tastes amazing. 
So by thinking of what variety, and you can find that on the charts that I offered in the slideshow and a lot more um, through uh, University of Florida, the species or the variety matters. And spicy globe basil is just absolutely terrific. And that is true of so many of the plants that we grow here. Our air carries some beasts that uh, aren't in the rest of the country. So by putting in the right variety, you get, have a better success. Yes, I agree with you. I, <clears throat> When this pandemic started, I grew cilantro, herb, basil, and they grew beautifully right in the my kitchen window seal. So pretty that my daughter didn't even want to eat them. So um, they really thrive there. Um, so we have another question. Um, let's see. What is, what's the best way to get citrus to bear fruit? Hmm. Wow. I, sometimes if it's a young tree, that may be the problem. Sometimes citrus won't bear fruit for five to seven years. That may be the problem. It may be a variety problem. Certainly there are citrus fertilizers that you can use that will help. It could be deficient in something. Um, those would be the first things I would look at is what is the variety and um, your soil just may not have enough nutrient to make it go. Citrus uh, blooms, I believe, in the spring and summer and produces fruit around December, January. Typically, some do it more often than that, like a calamondin can bear fruit all year round. Um, but what, in order to bear fruit, it's got to have flowers and that is often a phosphorus issue. Our, our native soil is high in phosphorus. That's why citrus does really well here. That's one of the reasons. So that's where I would start to look. I would also uh, search up, um, say you're dealing with a lemon, um, how to get more lemons, iphis or edis, and that might give you some more information. Got it. Thank you. We have another question um, that came in. What is the life cycle of tomato plants? Do we have to replant every year or do they persist year after year? Okay. It, it, in most gardening situations, it's considered an annual. So you start a new plant every year. There are tomato plants and they typically are the smaller fruited ones such as cherries and, and uh, what's the other, grape tomatoes that are considered indeterminate, which means they keep growing forever and ever and ever and ever, and they can get 40 feet tall. They're more vine-like, you hear tomato on the vine. So the indeterminates will grow a long time. An Everglades tomato plant, for instance, seem, seemingly can last forever and be 20 feet long and all over the ground. The, the larger uh, varieties, like a better boy, tend to be more uh, like an annual. I mean, you probably can keep them alive a little longer, but the plant isn't designed to last forever. Got it. Hope that helps. Yes, good information. We have another question that came in. What causes new basil leaves to ruffle? Basil, that's either a water or a fertilizer issue. Um, or it could be a variety issue if it's a variety that's supposed to ruffle. Um, I would suggest checking to make sure that the moisture in your pot goes all the way to the bottom of the pot and you can do that by sticking your finger all the way through the soil a lot of times people don't put enough water when they water and the soil down at the bottom with the new little roots isn't getting wet so that can cause distress or it could be a fertilizer issue so Got those it. are the places i would start Thank you. Okay, this one, this question is a good one because I do spend a lot of money on um, buying avocados, especially I love Haas avocados. So the question coming in is, can Haas avocados be grown here in a planter? Is it possible to grow Haas avocados in a planter? It might be. An avocado tree is a really, really big tree. Um, so putting it at a planter or a container of some kind when you limit the growth of the roots, you're going to limit the growth of the canopy. So while it is probably possible, um, I don't know how much success you're going to have with that. They absolutely can grow here. There are growers down in the Redland, in fact, um, under the auspices of Fairchild. And there are massive farms that have, I would say, dozens of varieties of avocados. Um, I don't know what avocado I have, but the fruit is the size of a football and it tastes like pure butter. They're just absolutely amazing. And the care that I give the tree is absolutely nothing. So avocados are happy here. There are diseases 
that are um, spreading around the county that can be a problem, and I am not familiar with the problems of the Haas variety, but I believe they grow here. Got it. Thank you, Terry. Uh, okay, we have another question. Is can I just dig my compost from my kitchen directly into the garden? I get this question a lot, and it's a great question. Um, it's not recommended. We need to break down the product. So say you have peeled um, uh, five pounds of potatoes, and you have all these peels, and you want to put them right into the garden. Well, they are they need to break down be and turn back to soil before you put them in the garden, or they can uh, just rot in the soil, and they also take up nitrogen as they break down. We want the we want to wait until the, they begin to give back nitrogen. So I would recommend that you put it in your compost bin for six months first, and then when it's soil, move it back to the garden. Got it. Good advice. And um, one one more question. So how do you become a master gardener? Does it cost money? Um, what is the the commitment of a master gardener? Tell us a, a little bit about your journey. First of all, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, it does not cost anything to become a master gardener. There is an upfront cost for some books. The first day that you walk into class, there'll be a stack of 10 of the most amazing gardening books that you've ever seen in your life on your desk, and you do have to buy those. Um, then there's the terror that, do I have to read all of those? And not only do you have to read them, but you have to pass tests on all of them, and it's absolutely wonderful. The course is uh, 10 to 12 weeks. It's run by the Extension Service. It usually starts in August, and I don't know with the pandemic if it ran this year, and it wraps up in December um, with a with a with the toughest final exam I've ever taken in my life. Then after that, the first year, you're expected to give 75 hours of volunteer work back, and then 35 hours every year after that. Um, throughout that time, we're always learning. They're constantly sending us uh, seminars, online workshops, uh, in-person workshops, so our education goes on constantly. It's really fun. Uh, to get into it, you can contact the Extension Office. Specifically, the director there is Adele Pena, and her email is, let me get that for you, I want to get it right. Um, of course, it's not on the top of my notes. Oh, Adele Pena, is, um, you can email her at Pena, it's P-E-N-A, a at ufl dot edu and that Adele will answer your questions. Thank you, thank you, Terry. I'll share that once again and the information from the University of Florida Extension Office where they can get all the information about becoming a master gardener. Okay, so we're gonna have one more. This will be the last question before we close it off. Um, would tomatoes that were planted too early produce fruit once the temperatures cool down? They should, as long as the plant is still healthy. Um, it, it might go into some distress now while it's still really, really hot. Um, that October, the second week in October um, timeline, there is a little bit of wiggle room. I noticed this morning it was cool enough outside to actually say for about 30 minutes that I was comfortable. So if you're comfortable, the plants will be. Um, so if you started them and you get them in the ground, there shouldn't be a problem. Just make sure they don't get in any stress. Okay, great, thank you. Well, I think that wraps up all our questions for today. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and sharing all your great tips and tricks in being a better organic gardener. Thank you to all our Facebook viewers for spending a little time during this beautiful Saturday morning joining us and learning about organic gardening. We really hope you had some great takeaways and the Village Parks and Recreation Department looks forward to offering a few more virtual gardening workshops in the upcoming months, along with some cooking classes, art classes, even virtual bingo. Stay tuned, details are coming soon. If you have a particular gardening topic of interest you would like for us to consider for a workshop, please email me at events at palmettobay-fl.gov. Again, that's events, E-V-E-N-T-S, at Palmetto Bay hyphen fl dot gov also thank you once again to johan george from our it department for all your help streaming this workshop live on facebook we couldn't have done this without you have a beautiful and rest restful weekend everyone stay healthy and please be safe happy gardening palmetto bay goodbye everybody bye <laughs>